Our text today is read from the 19th chapter of Revelation, beginning with verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! Then her smoke rose up forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia! And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These things are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather thyself together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with his flesh. Now the religious system has been exposed by God, the false religious system, and wrath and vengeance has been poured out upon it. As the last chapter said, and we didn't dwell too much on it, they were destroyed suddenly in one hour. Their end came rapidly. 
completely eliminated this great harlot system, this false Babylon. And, and she was gone. No place was found for her. She was found no more. This false religious system is in for a complete destruction before it's all over. And because that's true, it is also true that he, she is in a present state of being judged and being destroyed and is not at all what she seems to be. The wrath and the, and the vengeance of God has been poured out upon her. This is an operation that the dragon is indirectly responsible for, but it's set in motion by the humanistic activities and philosophies of the first beast. And the beast, you will recall, received his power, authority, and assignment from the dragon. Now the second beast, the false prophet, or the great harlot, received credentials and license from the beast. That assignment was, of course, to give glory, in other words, credibility, legitimacy, attention, importance to humanism, that demonic and false knowledge that descends from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Together, these two beasts go out to blaspheme God and in the process to deceive the nations. This beautiful religious system is a depository for the blood of the saints and the martyrs of all ages. Though it masquerades as truth, never forget for a moment that the sole purpose for its existence is to distort and to destroy truth. This is not a sideline. Religious humanism has no other assignment or purpose. Now, once God's judgment against the whore has been revealed, we hear a voice saying, Alleluia, salvation and honor and power unto the Lord our God. True and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged her. Now, Alleluia is constructed from several Hebrew words, and it simply means praise ye Jah, or in other words, praise ye Jehovah. This is more than the chorus of a song. It's more than an emotional outpouring. It's a declaration of something. Praise be to the Almighty. Praise be to Jehovah. In the Bible, there are various names by which God is known. Elohim, El Shaddai, or actually El Shaddai, Adon or Adoni, just El, Jehovah, and Jah, which is a shortened form of Jehovah, just as El is a shortened form of Elohim. And there are more names too, but these are the main constructions, with most of the others being combinations of these and specific things like the god of war or the god of harvest and so on. Each of them have a specific meaning. The name Jehovah means he who has life within himself and he who gives life. One form of Jehovah is I am. Jesus used this form in John 8:24 when he said to the Jews, for if ye believe not that I am you shall die in your sins. Now, in that case, the word he in the King James is an italicized word, and by this the translators are showing you that it was not in the original language and should not be in this text. Another meaning of the name Jehovah is the life. Now, you can see how that fits into what we have before us. This part of the revelation is about the struggle between the forces of life and light and righteousness as opposed to the subtle and deceiving forces of darkness, evil, and death. Praise be the giver of life. Praise be to the one who has life in himself. This praise is invoked in this instance because what God has done in judging the harlot, this dreadful and deceitful world of religious humanism, in the interest of bringing life. I should say, because of, of what God has done. 
In the modern world, the fallen human mind corrupts everything. In religious humanism, as well as secular humanism, we have an entirely distorted picture of what life is and how it's obtained. To the modern religious and secular mind, you show love by being permissive. You show love by allowing that what anybody wants to do is their business and none of ours. You show love by saying, well, I don't care what they do, how they do it, or who they do it with. I'm going to put my arm around them, and I'm going to tell them how much I love them, how much God loves them, and how much the church loves them. But this is utter, unadulterated, unscriptural, unbiblical rubbish and nonsense. This is not God's way at all. How do we know? Because it's not the biblical way. And the Bible defines God's way for us. Testimonies of the scripture are clear and unburdened by ambiguity in this regard. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet, and turn again, and rend you. The swine do not care about the pearls. They are in no way impressed with your foolish and out-of-touch display of emotion. All you're going to do, if you're not careful, is get close enough to those razor-sharp tusks to slit you wide open and let your blood and your guts pour out in that stinking, filthy, sour pigsty. And for what? I recall 40 years ago now, I guess, in my derelict years, sitting in a restaurant on the Ginza Strip in Tokyo with a beautiful Japanese geisha girl. I asked her what she thought of the American G.I. She stared at me, those black eyes snapping like electrical currents, and she asked me if I really wanted to know. Yes, I said, I, I would not have asked otherwise. We think you are the most ridiculous little fools in the world, she says. You come over here and you act like big shots and you throw your money around and spend more on one of us in a night than our men make in a week. Now, that's probably not true anymore, but it was then. And you think you're impressing someone. Well, I said, you're not the least bit reluctant to take it, I notice. No, she said, we're not, because we have utter contempt for you, and we know that if you don't give it to us, you'll waste it at the bar or gambling, and the more you give us, the more we despise you. 1977, I was in Hermosillo, Mexico, joint venturing a drilling job with a Mexican contracting firm. A great oil discovery had just been made in the Gulf of Mexico, and the French were in town, trying to win the right to develop it for the Mexican government. While I was there, Portillo Lopez, the president of Mexico, made a speech, and I was listening to it on the radio at the hotel where I was staying. Now that the French are here, he said, we do not have to go begging to the North Americans with our hat in our hand. He went on to quote Plato, As long as there are people who are rich enough to buy other men's souls, and as long as there are people who are poor enough to sell their souls, there will never be justice, he repeated. He went on to say that the Mexicans would continue to take the North American money and the humiliation that went with it because they were so poor that they had no alternative, but he hoped that this situation with the French would change that. I do not say that I agreed then or now with the Japanese girl or the Mexican president. In fact, I thought both of them were being overly defensive and more than a little unfair. But I cite these examples because they're two excellent ways to let you know what the evil world and the false church thinks of you for your gushing sentiment in indulging their vile behavior and quote and unquote not being judgmental. They have utter contempt for you as well they should. If you do not know the difference between a derelict trying to justify himself on the one hand 
and his attitude toward those who defend him in his reprobate behavior on the other, then you also are to be pitied. An effort to rid yourself of your own guilt complex by indulging the vices of the wicked is helping neither of you. If you're trying to use the philanthropy of absolution as a means of projecting nobility of character, then you need to go back and study Jesus' moral about the pigsty. In our judicial courts of law, abetting is a crime. The same is true at God's bar of justice. In Ezekiel 33, 8, God speaks through the prophet and says, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt utterly die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Closer to home, Jesus said in John 16, verses 7 through 11, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go unto my Father, and ye see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. From the Christian church there is the example of Ananias and Sapphira. Who put it in your heart, you wicked man, to lie to the Holy Ghost? St. Peter asked him. Ananias died right there on the spot. And St. Peter told them to carry him out and bury him with no fanfare. Just get him out of here and bury him. And that's what they did. In the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul lit into the church in Corinth. I can't believe what's going on down there, he said. Here's this wicked and corrupt creature in the church, and you people are all protecting him like as if that was your responsibility. I'll tell you what you do. I'll pass judgment on this man, and I've never seen him in my life, and I've never been in your church. But let me tell you this, when you get together the next time in the power of God and with my spirit, you deliver that man to the devil for the destruction of his flesh. Maybe that will teach him something. Maybe he will learn something from it. If not, good riddance, don't protect him for heaven's sakes. Throw him out as quick as you can do it, and wash your hands of such a person. The Bible tells us that if any man does not obey the doctrine that we have been taught in the Scriptures, you mark that man and you avoid him. This St. Paul said in Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. They are greedy and inconsiderate people who are using the church for their own selfish purposes, and no godly man or group of godly elders will let this go on for a moment. We are concerned about the victims, not the criminals. Rebuke them that sin and do it openly before the whole church, said St. Paul, 1 Timothy 5.20. We're not worried about whether or not this man here is humiliated. We're concerned about the purity of the church. If everyone sees it, it will put the fear in them, and they will know what is going to happen to them if they do these evil things. Today things are so out of control that we have men like Bob George who was caught in a motel room giving money to a policewoman posing as a prostitute and pleading no contest to that charge which is an admission of guilt, now denying that it ever happened and going on in an imaginary role of spiritual leadership. Now, this is the man who does not believe that Christian people ever need to confess sins and ask forgiveness. If God is not worried about my sin, he says publicly, then neither am I. Apparently he is not. And sadly, neither is much of the Christian world. We have been like Jimmy Swaggart, trying to hang on after having defied the decision of his own elders. 
We have men like David Hawking, recently removed from the ministry in the radio program by his elders for adultery, brazenly re-entering the airwaves as if nothing had happened. Is it any wonder no one takes Christianity, God, and the Bible seriously anymore? Christ and the church, comprehended in the four beasts and the four and twenty elders, fell down on their face before God and said, Amen, so be it, praise Jehovah. He has taken vengeance on the harlot, and that is as it should be, for true and righteous are his judgments. God has avenged us of this vile creature which deceived and corrupted the nations. The message here is clear. This is what God has done, and this is how righteous people look at it. They've always looked at it that way, and they always will. There is no other attitude for a righteous man to have, and conversely, a righteous person does not have any other attitude. Praise God because he has taken vengeance upon the great harlot. This is a present thing. The harlot church will go on functioning until the end of time, but wrath and vengeance have already fallen upon her. What goes on in the world of religious humanism, its lies, its false miracles, its phony healings, its mindless and emotionally distraught, incoherent blubbering that are attempted to be passed off for a work of God, its humanistic programs of mind manipulation, high-pressure sales, modern marketing techniques, and on and on, are the judgments of God. These soul, mind, and spirit-destroying disorders have come upon her because God has decreed it. These all comprise the filth of her fornication that men contract like a venereal disease when they intercourse with her. But a venereal disease stops when it has destroyed your mind and body. It cannot eat up your soul and your spirit like this stuff can. <laughs>